Well, I don't know that I'd go so far to say that technology advances hurt people with disabilities. But what you see happening is that when there's some sort of technological advance that becomes ubiquitous in the world, and there's a class of people who cannot use it, they're left behind. For the past several years, with a colleague, Rob Miller, here at CSAIL, I've been teaching a class called Principles and Practice of Assistive Technology. There's a project component where small teams of students get together with one person who lives close to MIT, who lives with a disability, and they spend the whole term trying to build a solution that will help that person live more independently. One was a project to make a home oven. The project was to make that accessible to somebody who was blind. My name is Paul Paravano. I live in Arlington, Massachusetts, and I work at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I lost my sight when I was about two or three. I had a form of retinal cancer. I'm uh, Italian, so it's sort of a cultural thing that, uh, you know, food and family and having meals together, I think, is important. And I used to make a lot of bread. At times when the oven was really pretty easy to use, you know, you just turned a dial, essentially, and you knew where to position the dial. Paul has an oven in his kitchen. The reason that he's not able to use it is because it has a flat panel touchscreen as its control panel. Because he's not able to see the screen at all, he is completely unable to use it. But he was very specific about what he wanted exactly. The idea is that when it is lined up properly, when this is mounted onto the display, that the holes will match up and these braille labels will identify which button is under that hole so that if I'm home alone, I can cook something in the oven. If I've been given some responsibility to prepare food for others, I can manage the oven aspect of that, which I could not do before. So it's really opened up just another, uh, you know, opportunity for me to contribute to the household, which I feel very strongly about. I think it felt like we were actually doing something for someone, so we were a lot more motivated to do everything. With Paul, there was always a point. We did another project with a person who uses his computer or controls his computer using a head tracker because he doesn't have the use of his hands. Jack is a really bright engineer who happens to have very aggressive MS and he's currently living in a home in Chelsea that lets him pretty much live most of his day-to-day -day life autonomously but for that he needs to use a computer. He uses it for you know, opening the door calling the elevator. He's paralyzed from his head down. And so he controls his computer using his head, and through that he controls the rest of the world as much as possible. I'm 40 years old. Went to college at Cornell. Got school at Caltech. That worked a bit. Second Valley, then New York City. First start up, then I was diagnosed with MS. Jack's previous solution was called point and click that allows complete usage of a mouse, but not specifically efficiently. If you're Jack, you have to look back at the menu anytime you want to do something different. Our solution tries to remove as much as possible having to look back at the application. Jack's specific system is he always has to wear glasses, so there's a tiny reflective dot on the middle of his glasses and there's one camera on top of his computer and it tracks the dot. So he moves his head and his head moves his mouse on the screen. Make it easier. Choose the computer. First 
I, before taking this course, never considered I could use computer science to help somebody who's disabled. After this course, I know as long as you take in mind what those people might need, it can be really helpful. But when you just neglect how people use your product when you're evolving it, you can leave people behind that you really shouldn't.